following our service, it's not an announcement. Uh, we do have an egg hunt for the kids, and our security uh, went out and found a family collecting all of our eggs. <laughs> uh, they, they were politely told they had to give them back. I say that uh, not because I want your attention to go away from this very important fact. Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka, eight bombs went off. 207 people are dead and 1,000 are wounded. Both churches and hotels where foreigners are likely to stay were the focus of those explosions. So on Resurrection Sunday, when Christians have gathered in their churches to celebrate the resurrected Lord, 207 people have stepped into eternity. Uh, people trying to steal your candy eggs? Not a big deal. The night was losing the battle with the approaching daylight as a group of ladies left their homes headed for the tomb. They were carrying baskets filled with supplies and hearts filled with good intentions. They didn't say much on their journey, but they thought a lot to themselves about how horrible the last few days had been. Jesus deserved better they thought. They were devoted to and loved deeply Jesus, were a part of his ministry team from the very beginning. When the fingers of dawn had squeezed the last bit of darkness from the sky, they reached the garden where he was buried. They knew that place well because they had been there when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had buried him. They had watched him die on the cross and then watched him be buried, and now they were back. But as they were approaching the area, one of them asked an extremely important question. Who will roll away the stone for us? One of the ladies asked. For a very large stone had been rolled in front of the tombs. They knew nothing of the Roman guards who had sent had been sent there to seal it with the Roman seal and to guard it from anybody entering. They had planned their adventure down to the last detail except for how they were going to get into the tomb. They had no idea that sometime before dawn an angel from heaven had come down and had rolled back the stone. And his presence was so severe that the detachment of soldiers that were there guarding the tomb fell unconscious before him. When the ladies reached the tomb, they found it empty. And here the accounts begin to get a little scattered. What we know for sure is this. These women who faithfully followed Jesus were at the cross watching him die. They were the same women who followed Joseph and Arimathea to the, to the gravesite. They watched as they prepared his body and buried him. And by their actions, we can deduce that they were not satisfied with how Jesus' body had been prepared. It was the job of ladies to prepare the bodies for burial. The women did that. And so as they watched these two men doing it, they watched with somewhat of a critical eye. They weren't doing it right. They thought Jesus deserved better than he was getting. By their actions, we also know they were completely fearless. They were not the least bit concerned with the Pharisees, for they had been at the cross, they had been to the tomb, and they were coming back to the tomb. Whereas the apostles, I have to say, shamefully, were locked in an upper room. The accounts harmonize like this. 
We know the names of some of the women. There was Mary, the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, Mary Magdalene, and another Mary. Before sunrise, the tomb had been opened by an angel. We know that. These women in our story discovered an empty tomb. Mary Magdalene runs to tell Peter and John that somebody had taken the body of Jesus, and they didn't know where it was. The other women remained at the tomb and encountered two angels. And the angels told them, why are you looking for a dead person, I mean a living person among the dead? He has risen just as he said he would. And this great invitation, which is given over and over again in churches all over the world today, is come and see and then go and tell. Peter and John ran to the tomb. John stopped. He was younger and faster, and he stopped, and he's looking in the tomb. Peter just blows right through the door. John comes in the tomb, and they're standing there looking at what they're looking, and the scriptures tell us that John looked where Jesus had laid and believed. He processed and believed because what he was looking at was a wrapped body in the shape of a wrapped body with no body in it. It isn't that Jesus was unwrapped. It isn't that somebody took him, so why would they leave the grave clothes? It was that he just passed through the grave clothes. It was enough for John. He's risen. Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb, and Jesus makes his first visible appearance to her. We know the story. She thought he was the gardener, and she says, "Uh, Do you know where they have taken him? And she sa- or he says, Mary. And she melts. John chapter 10 says, my sheep hear my voice. And they know me. She fell at his feet. We also know that Jesus appeared to the other women in Matthew 28. That was his second appearance. Told him to go tell the guys to meet me in Galilee. Those who had been guarding the tomb reported to the religious leaders of the Jews that the tomb was empty and what had happened and how that they had been knocked unconscious by the brilliance of an angel and they were bribed, healthily bribed, to lie. Say somebody come and stole the body. These women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. The first message of the resurrection was proclaimed by a woman. This is the truth. This is what happened. This is how the accounts are harmonized. The fact is Jesus was dead, but he is now alive. Over the course of the next 40 days, Jesus popped in and out of the lives of the groups of people who claimed to be Christians. He wasn't around them every day like he had been before. He came and went as it served his purpose. We are told in 1 Corinthians that over 500 believers saw him together at one time. He is alive. These people knew it. The resurrection changed their lives and it shocked our world. But if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God hath raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We get to celebrate this morning because of the risen Savior. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we get to celebrate this morning. That, that symbol of baptism that we were buried and raised to walk in newness in life. Because of Jesus rising from the grave, that we can celebrate that. But I don't want to miss out on one important thing, is that Friday was very important to the faith. Oftentimes we think of Easter as just Sunday morning, but we often forget why Friday is important. If Jesus doesn't die, then we're still dead in our sins. That we have no way to bridge that gap that our sins have caused. See, Jesus had to die on Friday so he could be our mediator and bridge that huge void caused by sin with God. 
So 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. John 14.6 said, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father <clears throat> except through me. But see, if Jesus just died but didn't rise from the grave, then his claims of being God would be false. He'd be looked as more than just a, just a prophet, nothing more. And again, we would still be stuck in our sins with no way to bridge that gap. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, And if Christ had not been raised, then our, our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. We have to realize as followers of Christ how important both Friday and Sunday is. We have to see, because of the first Adam, because of, the, of sin in Genesis chapter 3, that we are separated from God. But because of the second Adam, we are restored and can be saved from our sins. This is what Jesus does. He takes us out of our sins. He takes us from where we were to become more like the person he wants us to be, redeeming us and making us whole again. But if you haven't given your life to Christ, or if you're sitting here kind of skeptical, like, I don't, I don't believe that. I've never seen that in my own life or anyone else in my life. I want to give you some, peop- some stories in Scripture where we see people's lives change just by encountering and meeting Jesus. In John chapter 4, it's a very well-known story of a woman at the well. I'm not going to go through the whole story because you probably know it, but this woman had been living a life of sin and was going to the well at a time where no one else was going because she was an outcast of her own people. And so as she's going to get water, she encounters Jesus, and she is a Samaritan, which there was a lot of tension between Samaritans and Jews. And so for Jesus to encounter her was a very bold thing to do. And so she was an outcast, and her life was going to be changed that very day. Little did she know to get water that morning that she was going to her life be changed. Her, she encountered Jesus. She had been hearing of this Messiah And then as soon as she realizes that that's who is in front of her, you know what she does? She leaves her her water jar and runs to the town and says, I think I found him. I think I've encountered the Christ, the Messiah. And it tells us in John chapter 4 that many Samaritans have believed because of her testimony. Believed because of her sharing her faith. She goes from being a social outcast to being an evangelist just like that. In John chapter 8, we see the story of the woman caught in adultery. And this story is special to my own heart because of how impactful it was for me. This woman was used as a pawn by the, by the Pharisees to trap Jesus. They were trying to find a way to have Jesus uh, uh, caught in what he was saying so he can be crucified. But little did she know that day that her life was going to be changed. She was brought there to be stoned for her sins, that she, according to the law, she was to be stoned, but she got something far greater than that. And after Jesus dealt with the Pharisees, I encourage you to go read that story, because he deals with the Pharisees in a really cool way. But as he deals with the Pharisees and helps them to see on their own inward selves, and as they all walk away, it's just Jesus and the woman. And I want to read this to you, because this is powerful. John Chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. Only he, talking about Jesus, was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up and and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. That day she feared for her life. Not just her physical life, but her spiritual life was saved in that moment. She was given forgiveness and grace to not sin anymore. She was empowered to not sin anymore. You can see every time that Jesus encountered the disciples, their lives were forever changed. Jesus would come by and see them where they're at. Many of them were fishermen or or tax collectors. He'd walk by and say, come and follow me. Be a part of this. I want you to join me and follow me. And what they do, they stop everything and they follow Jesus and their lives are forever changed. We see throughout all the New Testament how the disciples are used by Jesus and the gospel advancing God's kingdom. And the last one I want to focus on is the Apostle Paul. 
Paul, for, formerly known as Saul, was one of the top dogs, one of the, the high chief in, in, with the Pharisees, and he was killing followers of Christ at the time. His job was trying to get rid of them all, and then his life was forever changed on that day to Damascus. As he encountered the risen Lord, all in his glory, Saul was blinded, and he was taken to Damascus. The Lord used a man named Ananias to not only heal Paul's physical struggles, but healed him of his spiritual struggles. It says right after that he was healed and immediately was baptized and he was preaching the gospel. This is what Jesus does. He takes people from where they were and he makes them become more like him. He takes them where we're stuck in our sin and he gives us grace and forgiveness to conquer that sin. And to become more like him. This is what the gospel does. It changes everything that it encounters. The gospel is the good news that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. But it's not that Jesus just died, that he lived a perfect life, the life that you and I cannot live, and that he died the death that you and I deserve, and that when he busted out of that grave, he gave us a way to have eternal life. The gospel is Jesus. It's not about doing more. It's not about being better. It's not about checking off all these different things. It's not about trying to be more in religion or more in church. It's about being more in tune with Jesus, becoming more like him, becoming more like our risen Savior, knowing that the gospel is only Jesus, nothing more. The gospel is confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing when he said it is finished, that he meant it. Not just then, but at this very moment, he means it. Only because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus can we be, have eternal life and be blameless in God's sight. There was an author that wrote a book called Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything. There's nothing that you need to add to Jesus. You have Jesus and nothing else. You have everything that you can need in this world. But if you have everything... Minus Jesus, you have emptiness. we got to stop striving after all these different things. we got to strive to have a relationship with the risen Savior. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has, son, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever has, does not have the Son of God does not have life. Amen. Do you have eternal life this morning? Woo, Pastor Brandon issued a challenge and an opportunity, an opportunity for you to come and taste the sweetness of Jesus. And what does that opportunity of Jesus bring? Hope. It's hope. Jesus is offering you hope today. But many of us sitting in here right now, we've already tasted the sweetness of Jesus. We've already come to that point where we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. And he's giving us the same hope because it's Resurrection Sunday. And we come in on Resurrection Sunday and we should get excited. And if you're not, you should be. It's Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. And he's passing out hope everywhere. Hope for all of us. Hope for us to be our best selves. Isn't that what we want? What we want is to be our best selves. And Jesus says, I am giving you hope because it's Resurrection Sunday. But I know what you're thinking because it's the same thing I think at times. It's not Friday. We don't get stuck in Friday. For most of us who are believers, we know Friday came. We know Jesus died. We know that he paid our sins. We're extremely grateful for it. We're not stuck on Resurrection Sunday either. We know he rose from the grave. Some of you struggle with that. And I pray for you that you can come to the realization of what Jesus has done for you. But most of us, we know that truth. We can celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. We can get excited about it because we know it's true. It's not Friday and it's not the Sunday that gets us the trouble. It's the Monday. It's Monday. It's because when I get out of church, I'm going to go and find my eggs missing. <laughs> or worse, I'm going to find my life is over. 
I'm going to get on Monday, and there's going to be bill collectors calling me, and I don't have the money. I'm going to get on Monday, and my children are going to drive me crazy. I'm going to get on Monday, and the one that I love that I still miss is still going to be gone. And my heart's still going to ache. I'm going to get on Monday, and that sin that so easily beset me still is grabbing a hold of me and pulling me down. And we think, wait a second, what happened to the power of the resurrection? What happened to the hope? And we think the hope disappears. But it's not gone. It's not gone. The opportunity for you to be your best self every day is the opportunity of resurrection day. You see, we've been walking through the steps of the tomb. Those of you who have been with us through the last several weeks, when hope's been up, we've been walking through the steps of the tomb. We walked through and saw that Jesus, in the raising of Lazarus, got the power over death, that he demonstrated it for himself, and he knew that he could conquer death and God could overcome anything, and his fear was put to death. And then we saw Jesus when he was anointed, at his feet was anointed, and he's praised and worshiped, and he saw true worshipers worshiping and praising him. The reality of what eternity will be is praising and worshiping Jesus. That's what the reality is going to be. And so we look and see that it's not about us. There's no fear that needs to overcome me. It's not about me and my pride gets put away. Oh, but Jesus is so good. Because then we look on Palm Sunday when he's coming down the aisles that are filled with the palm leaves and he's being praised. What God is saying is, but your identity is sure. His identity of the Messiah was sure. And your identity as a child of God is sure and set. And then we looked on Friday when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, not my will but yours be done. That we must slay our own wills. So that we can do this, so that we can die to ourselves, that we might have resurrection day every day. Our God is so good that he knows that we can't just experience resurrection day on a Sunday and expect it to last us forever. Now I want you to know, some of you come here every Easter for, on Sunday to experience the power of resurrection day, and I sure love having you, but man, God wants more for you. He's got better. He says, listen, I want you to experience resurrection day every day. Think about the joy you feel as we sing those songs. Think about the joy as we sing glorious day where he called my name and I came out of the grave. The power that we feel in that, yes, Jesus called me and pulled me out of the grave of sickness. Think about the reality of death was arrested. Think about amazing grace that came and saved you and redeemed you and the power of the blood that will never lose it. Think about how excited we get about that and think about experiencing it every day. Waking up on Monday and going, this is resurrection day. Because myself is dead. Jesus in John chapter 12 said, said this. He said, now the time has come for the Son of Man wait, to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve, serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Jesus makes this simple truth that in order for it to produce the fruit and grow, it must die. And he's talking about himself and then he pulls us in with him. And some of you, when you heard me read that if anyone loves this life, he must lose it, you are filled with both guilt and worry because you do love this life. And you are afraid to lose it. Your life is good. You like where you're at. And you're like, oh my goodness, I don't know that I want to do that. Some of you, on the other hand, are more concerned when it looks and says um, that we must give up our life. Over here, lost again. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. You're like, that's me. I don't care. The reason why it's difficult to articulate for you what it is, is it's different for each of us. Because I don't have to die to you. I don't have to die to what your worries and concerns are. I don't have to die to what your difficulties are. I have to die to my own. You have to die to self. But I promise you this. When we pursue it, when we pursue it in our hearts and our minds and desire to die to self, Jesus will show you where it is you need to die. 
He'll make it clear. And then the reality of Galatians 2.20 can be in your life. My old self is crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by focusing on the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is hope. You can be the best you. The best you is a dead you. Die to yourself and live out the glory of what God has. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, I love you and thank you for who you are. Thank you for the power of your word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of the resurrection. And we ask that now in each of our hearts you would make the message clear and plain to us. Show us what needs to go. Show us where we are truly with you in Jesus' name.